Welcome to the Inspirational Insights Insight to Action podcast. My name is Donna Jones. I'm your host. This podcast specializes in looking at radical, complex change, uncertainty, and how we can be better as humans in working with that, both in our own lives and also in business as well. With me today is Zumbrook Errol. We're going to be talking about purpose, how your work experience and the work experience people had during the pandemic has shifted to a degree their sense of purpose, certainly autonomy, certainly the freedom to be more true to who you are as an individual. We're going to look at purpose through the personal side and the personal journey, and then also through the business side of the journey. How can stronger, more inspiring purpose guide companies through the recovery process and through the adaptation process to really use the interruption that a global pandemic offered to be better in the work cultures and be better for society and better for the planet. First off, let me just do a quick intro. I know you're Turkish and I'm using your second name. When I finish doing your intro, we'll just roll back and get your background a little bit better framed up because you bring a lovely global perspective, which is invaluable today. Brooke worked at IBM for 11 years, held positions as VP of sales and marketing. She started her first business when she popped out of the corporate experience to help people step into a more meaningful and fulfilling life by using what really mattered, true gifts. She's now doing career coaching to help people become more aligned with what they do, become more fulfilled in life and at work because she'd been working with lots of very smart, capable people who are also very unhappy at work. She wanted to have a bigger impact and began working with CEOs, entrepreneurs, and HR directors to create work cultures that increase engagement, happiness at work while at the same time, increasing profit. Her first book was called Create a Life You Live. It falls out of leaving IBM to to get started on a different life altogether. Her second book was called uh, Purposeful Business. I had the opportunity and the privilege of working with Brooke in the contribution that we all did from hierarchy to high performance. She put it in a chapter called Purpose Beyond Profit, and it's available on Amazon. First of all, thank you, of course, for inviting me because I have been following your podcast for a long time. I love the guests that you have, not the ones that we always see every day. You somehow find the best people around the world to go into really interesting topics and have great questions. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, you did sum it up actually, but it's just the journey. Life is a journey. The story goes on and changes you make plans and those changes too, but I really want to live a more meaningful life. And that brought me from Turkey to here to give a better life for my son. Things are not going so well in my country, but of course, I'm always embracing my original country and our traditions and stuff that is really very valuable to me. It's very interesting to come to and live in a different culture because you learn a lot you understand there could be many different perspectives to look at. I'm very observant and I love to learn the good things that I see in other countries, other cultures that I'm immersed in. It's been a good journey. I love the purpose journey because I'm a big believer, obviously. Now you've been how long in the United States? I'm in Canada for um, those of you new to the program. Brooke is in SoCal in Southern California. Yes, I've been here a little over 23 years now. And we always were in San Diego. You can't tell when you go back to your own country. You have a different mindset now. It's hard. And we talk about that with my friends there, but also my friends here who have gone through the same mindset shift. We do want to embrace the good parts, but we are different people now. Yeah. Let's wander through the topic of purpose in terms of your journey. You left IBM feeling how, and then out of that, you did what? Actually, purpose came to me when I was still working there. I don't know where it came from, but I remember even a day vividly after work hours, I was still in my office and thinking, okay, I'm preparing proposals. I have clients that I visit. I love them. I'm doing these repetitive tasks, but I wanted to see how Everything I do on a daily basis contributes to others. Who am I contributing to? Somehow I had to have the answer to that. And at the time, of course, nobody was talking about purpose. So if I ever asked this question out loud, people were looking at me like, are you crazy? You are making good money. You are at a beautiful office, which is true. And they were investing a lot of money on us and our education. 
just, it seemed like everything is perfect on paper, but something was missing for me. When I asked, what's my purpose of working here? I found something. Finding that made me feel a little bit better because I felt like I'm exposing my clients to the best technology so that they can serve their clients better. Even that made me feel better instead of, okay, I do this, 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 this repetitive task, task every day. But then, of course, the next question is, do you want to do this for the rest of your life? At the time I started working, people were expected to probably stay in the same job, maybe have two jobs and retire. I had that long-term thing that I was thinking and I said like, no, this is not something that excites me. It doesn't make me passionate. And I'm such a big reader. I don't want to open up a book or even a magazine about technology. I use that with my clients too. Where do you go in a bookstore immediately? Which section? I would never go to the IT section. That made me feel like, okay, I'm not so much interested. I love my clients, the relationships, my coworkers, the office and the social part of it, but not the core of what I do. By the time I left the company, I had so much conflict in myself about what I'm doing but I didn't have the language for it either when people were saying you're not happy I couldn't really have the words to explain it to them people are very analytical they want you to have very logical answer to their questions right and I said like I'm not happy I don't know I'm not fulfilled here in hindsight a lot of my values were in conflict with what they asked me to do. Now I know for sure values was a big part. And the fact that I wasn't in feeling in flow or I wasn't excited or passionate about what I did got me out of there. I also started having some physical issues, which I know was coming from my stress at work. I didn't find any new job. I did have no idea what I want to do. I didn't know what my purpose in life is. I knew I had to quit. To the surprise of many people, years later, they called me, oh, you're the bravest person I met. I said, what? What brave? I never thought about it as brave. I had to quit and I did. At the same time, we were thinking of coming to United States without finding any job, very little money, because I think we were crazy. And we had a four-year-old son that we were responsible for. <laughs> but I don't know how we did it. And I don't recommend it. But we did it anyway. So the three of us came here with little money and no job waiting for us. We thought it was going to be easy. Why we thought that way is in Turkey, we had the best education. We went to the best schools possible. So everybody wanted to hire us. Even though we didn't think it's going to be that easy, we didn't think it's going to be hard either. That started our journey here. After one year, actually went back because we like, used all our money, which wasn't a lot. <laughs> back in Turkey, again, we had a very tough five months and we were back again after five months. I had to find some jobs because I had to pay the bills. I did some other work, but that question never left me. What's my purpose? What's my purpose? Where can I find meaning? It wasn't only my experience. The general sense at work did not work for me either. I thought of work in a much better way when I saw people are always waiting for their Fridays or people are older, always working for their retirement. I said, wow, this doesn't work for me. I can't waste all other days and wait for some other future that I'm not promised yet. Just to gist of the work that we accepted did not work for me either. It was hard for me to find a job that would satisfy me. I did start my first business in 2003, Your Best Life, to help people like myself. I had a great coach, which made everything clear for me, from my skill sets to gifts, what matters to me the most, what are my dreams. And I love, love, love that process so much that I said, oh my God, I have to do this for others. Because we never do that in school or after school or at work. That's how it all started. So started helping people find their gifts, their dreams, their values. Very important, I think. And then how do they use all those dreams, values, gifts that they have in a way that matters to them, that contributes to others too? That's what I mean by purpose. And I saw a lot of them were like me. A lot of people with lots of potential skills and everything, 
but they're miserable at work, not unhappy, but miserable. I said, something is wrong and the organizations are doing something really wrong. That's when I started my purposeful business because I said, okay, let me do some work in the organizational side because that's not gonna impact only one person that I work with, but everybody who works for that company, that's what got me there. I'm still doing both sides, but I believe that is a big foundation. It doesn't solve the problems of today, but that's where I start from because until you know your why, why you are in this world, why do you want to wake up tomorrow? Or the company is formed and established, it has a profit goal, but what else are you gonna do in this world? If you don't have the answers to that, I don't know how to move forward. I really don't know how to do that, really. A long answer to a question, but hopefully I answered it. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did. Should we bump it up to the organizational business level? Sure. You and I talked about during COVID, which would have been the opportune moment, as Captain Jack Sparrow would say, to do some serious innovation. That did and didn't happen. We had technological tweaks in innovation, but we didn't see the kind of radical change for workplace cultures that certainly I was hoping would mean that people could go to work and not come away feeling exhausted, depleted, and like they're not really having any fun. What did you observe during COVID and how does purpose contribute to a shift in how we function as companies and how we function as decision makers? Yeah, thank you for that question because you know how much I was paying attention to every company that I had in my list. First of all, I'm always making a list of companies, but it's really not easy to get into my list because I'm really doing some background. Unfortunately, some companies felt like, okay, all purpose seems to be a nice trend now. Let me jump in the wagon. But they only did nice looking purpose statements, which they thought is going to be enough, which obviously is not. It's not a marketing tool. That's why when you... I say a company is in my list. They should not only have a purpose statement, but they should be in a very different mindset where always people comes first. I don't think there's any one great purpose-driven company who doesn't put their people first. That's almost a prerequisite for that. Another prerequisite is the leader, the founders, believing that this is going to work for their company. If they don't believe that the workplace could be better, people can be motivated besides the external factors, they're not going to do anything, right? So I was watching very closely the new companies that I was seeing. They changed their whole manufacturing family lines to do more COVID-related things. They did help a lot of their employees do the right thing or They didn't put any pressure on them. Some of the companies that I never heard of really stepped up to the plate and they became really very purpose-driven. Some of the companies that were already on my list, I was watching them very closely too. And they did amazing during this pandemic. Almost none of them got negatively impacted. Economically, maybe, but they always found a way to stay, to stick together, be true to their purpose and help each other. If they had been hit economically, what they did was, okay, let's get together. Let's not try to lay off people. Everybody got pay cuts by their own will. They volunteered for that, for example, because they already have this amazing culture that bonds them. They really feel like they are doing something that is more than the individual wishes and dreams or just making money at work. So they did amazing. I have never heard any one of them suffer too much. And then, unfortunately, the big percentage of them are struggling. They had a lot of fear of losing control and they had no idea what to do and went with very band-aid solutions, right? Just very surface solutions that were not authentic, unfortunately. I would have wished like you, this is the time to look at your culture and do the right things. But I think they go into panic. They have a lot of fear of losing control. And some of them don't understand the depths of the work that I do or a lot of us do. And so they want to be very quick and fast and they're not doing the right thing and not spending the right time. I'm still hopeful though, in every big event, in every big disaster, every tragedy, I always feel there's one more subset of companies who learn something. So I think that subset is there. 
who's more willing to listen to the transformation in the workplace, just seeing that people are leaving in big numbers, especially in the United States. I don't know about Canada, but a lot of people left the company. They called it big resignation. But one of the CEOs that I love calls it big escape, which I love more. It is the big escape. So I think those all give me some hope too, because now employees are like the activists. They demand more, they want more from companies and they should. That's yeah. where we are in, in just in general terms. I'm also grateful to see when you speak of activism, it just reminds me that there's a number of, of companies, there's employees have just said, no, we want ethical behavior from you. Let's not endorse and support and enable unethical behavior. Now you've got examples. I know you do. <laughs> a mm-hmm. lot of them. Yes. Care to share. Yes, of course. So there are the big names. I want to mention them because everybody recognized them, but I'm going to talk about them. some names that may, people or your audience might not have heard before. Southwest has been a great example for me. It's the domestic airline for those of you who don't know in the United States. Even in the 2008 big economic crisis, when 80,000 people were laid off in all the other airlines, they did not lay off one person. They were able to stick together. They are one of the most purpose-driven companies that I know of. They connect people with things that matter to them in an affordable way. That's what their purpose statement is. I'm sure I'm not quoting it 100%. It's a great example that purpose statement is not there just to be looking nice and looking good. It needs your integrity to stick with it. What they did when everybody started charging for luggage for domestic lines the shareholders and everybody forced them to do the same. They said, no, look at our purpose statement. It says affordable. We are never going to charge our customers for the luggage. They put up a big fight for it. You can't put a statement there and say affordable, but not stick with it. So they said, no, I'm sure. I don't know. I should look into that too. They even got more fans like me who's going to stick with them no matter what, because they were doing the right thing. The shareholders were saying, you left $300 million a year on the table. And I'm sure they made more money because they have consumers and clients like me, who's going to stick with them even more. But that's what it means. You cannot put up a statement and just forget about it. You have to make every decision based on that, which many of the companies that I work with still do not understand. Unfortunately, Patagonia is, of course, is a great example of the big companies. I want to give you an example like True Colors. It's a brewery company in the east side of the United States, and they make people's lives better one beer at a time by giving them economic opportunity. And do you know what they do? They hire people from all walks of life, but mostly gang members. Two people in that company both have served in prison. They're hired for really great positions because the owner found somebody shot on the street, African-American, and he started looking into this. What can I do for this community? What can I do? He says, if people are given economic opportunity, they are not going to be part of the gangs. Think about a brewery company having such an unbelievable purpose. Some people, when I go and do the purpose sessions, they always want to talk about the benefits of the product because our mind is so set in those ways. It doesn't have to be that. This guy has started this company to help gang members have a better life and they teach them life skills. The university program that they have when they hire people are amazing. It's not only about brewing. It's all about life skills that you need to have. Unbelievable. A lot of people might have heard because they became a global company in Japur Rags in India. They have 40,000 weavers. The owner was told not to even bother because they are lazy people, women who don't want to do anything. He hired all of them. All of them have now economic opportunity. They are creating art. They even can come up with their own designs for rugs. And they're getting awards. People in the little villages of India. And one more thing that I heard recently when I had my interview with the founder was that if you, let's say, I'm in the United States and I want to buy a rug from them, I can get connected to the person who weaved that like rug. I know who did that and I can have a post 
card and communication with that person. I loved it. He said, and he did say it very honestly. He said, I never thought about the purpose. But then he said, people came in and they saw what I'm doing. And they said, oh my God, you have such an unbelievable purpose. It's not only weaving rugs and selling it worldwide. You change their lives, basically, by giving them opportunity to make money and even create art. I can go on on and on. There is busy mortgage in Netherlands. They're making mortgage much more accessible to families who might think they're not affording it. They have an amazing culture. I'm trying to talk to as many people as possible and putting them on my YouTube channel just to inspire because there's so many skeptics out there who think that it's just a fad or it's just something that's trendy and going to go away. But there are companies from 1940s, 50s that have purpose since then, and it's working really well for them. That's the foundation. Then you have to do the values. You have to do the vision. Of course, then you have to be people first and you have the autonomy. There's a lot of other factors But that's where it all starts. I absolutely agree with you. And it's funny when you started mentioning Southwest Airlines, they are featured in the seven exemplar companies that Joseph Bragdon writes about in terms of companies that mimic the principles of life. Yes. They've designed themselves to be, I call it biomimicry management. They manage in accordance to those principles. And those principles are far longer lasting than anything the industrial era came up with because they recognize we're part of a living system. We're not above it. We are in it. And so is business. So yeah, Yeah. wonderful examples. And that's why I think during the most difficult times, they always survive. No matter what hits them, it survives. I have one more example from Turkey, my country, which is in horrible shape. But even in that environment, you can create a self-managed, very purpose-driven, very autonomous, a wonderful company. People always used to tell me, oh, of course it can happen in the United States. Of course it can happen in Canada. But it's not that. It's just your belief system that starts everything. If you don't believe, you're never going to look into the opportunities to build up a company like that. I love giving examples from different companies and I interview them because I want them to see it's possible everywhere. There is no limitation. It's only in our minds that we have the limitation. Well said, because otherwise you end up with, you know, it's Monday, we can't do it, we can't do it because we're a different kind of company, we can't do it because we're in in India, and honestly, it's all this mental uh, monkey business going on up there, I really appreciate what you've just said, and and the examples you've given cover quite a span. The -hmm. other thing that I was thinking about when you mentioned both Patagonia and Southwest, because those are both exemplar companies Mm -hmm. in terms of adaptive agilities, is their capacity to hold true. Because if there's one test of a company's integrity, it's when the going gets rough, they run backwards, they pedal backwards as fast as they possibly can. And what you've given in both those examples is no, you don't, you step up to the place. It's the next level of leadership you're aiming for. We're in the stage where next level leadership is essential. Yes. Yes. I think you just nailed it. It's really in the most rough times that you're tested if you can still be true to yourself. Before I got to my purposeful business, I did go and search for companies for a couple of years on my own. I knew there was going to be companies who are doing amazing financially, but also making their people happy. It's no coincidence that I got into purpose because in all the ones that I found throughout the world, no matter what size or shape or industry they're in, they always had two common denominators. They had an amazing, empathetic, caring leaders, and they always had a purpose beyond profit. And all of them stood for something that matters to them besides making profit. That made me believe even more into purpose. Another example is WD-40. I love them to death. The CEO, Gary Rich, is the most amazing leaders I've ever met. Since I know him so well, I have followed up with him throughout the Uh, pandemic, he sent me a survey that they did during the pandemic. They always have engagement rates around 98%, which is amazing to me. They were still so proud to be part of WD-40. Everybody makes their own decisions. They did really amazing job throughout the whole two and a half years. I don't think it's a coincidence. During the rough times we all went through, 
nothing happened to them. They're so resilient. They were able to adapt because they trust each other. There's so much trust and there's not a need for control. You and I saw companies, including spyware, to make sure that people are working, watching them. I was going to go crazy. These companies that I'm following, nothing close to that. And on top of it, they trusted their people all along. That's what you want. WG40 has one of the best offices. And I was even worried, oh my God, that best office is all empty now during the pandemic. And I was going to even ask, give me the keys. I want to work there. Really a good presentation of what their culture looks like into the physical world too. But then when I met him just recently, he says, yeah, we invited whoever is comfortable. If they're not, they're not coming in. And that's okay with us too. And I know how much money is spent on that office too. This is what we all want for all organizations. The spyware business was very oh, alarming, gosh. disturbing. The level of fear and paranoia is at new lows. New lows yes. as far as I can yes, tell. Yes, I agree. Yeah. It was disturbing. It still is. There's two directions we can take this. It, one is to look at the role of business in society. Because we have traditionally, and all our regulatory agencies have all put into place, you're in business to make a profit. That's who you are. That's what you do. Society is changing. The world is changing. Ecological systems are degraded. This is my thing. We could be a whole lot smarter about whether we want to survive as a civilization or not. And we're not choosing that. One of the things I wanted to do was to introduce conversations around restoring, regenerating vitality to the planetary systems we rely on. It's a tough one to get in. When you look at your survey of what kind of purposes are inspiring, what's the gist of them? Is there stratification around operational purpose to high level uh, regenerative purpose? What's the quality you're observing? It differs from one company to another. Sometimes it has very much related to their product. Sometimes it's only about their people. WD-40 create these maintenance, repair, lubricants, but their purpose is creating livable memories all day long. That's their purpose, right? It has nothing to do with their product. So what I'm seeing, and I believe, that's why I always add planet, people and planet. One of the best things that I ever read I think it was from British Academy, all the consumers, I mean, conscious consumers, the world, the employees, the workers, everybody expects companies not only to be existing for profit. Those days are gone. If they're going to keep on doing that, good luck to them. The demand, the activism from all the consumers and the people says, we want you to profit from solving people and planet problems, not causing more harm to people and planet to make profit. And that's what we've seen over and over again in front of our eyes. Lots of big companies that I followed, even I've been a customer, I quit them because it's not because they treat me wrong as a consumer, as their client, they sometimes treat me in the best way, like the bank that I worked with for years to come. But I saw how they're treating their people and putting so much pressure on them that I quit them. This is what the companies need to learn. It's not only how you treat your customers, because that's when I started working at IBM. Customers always came first, no matter what. And it was, if you want to make your customers happy, you can make your people miserable. That was okay, but the customers needed to be happy. Now customers also care about this. I always start with the question when I go to a company, Why does your company exist in the world besides making profit? What are you contributing to? They have to be able to show something. And whatever that is cannot harm the planet either. Even a friend of mine asked, okay, think about the dishwasher liquid company. What would the purpose of that be? First of all, anything that you say to elevate and uplift your people could be your purpose, unrelated to your product. But if it's a dishwashing liquid manufacturer, your one promise to your people should be not to harm the planet because whatever you're doing, the manufacturing cannot harm the planet or you are going to do everything you can to make it better and more regenerative so that you're not leaving our home planet in a worse place. And that's what everybody demands now. Sometimes 
the most traditional companies, command control companies still don't care about their people. They really simply don't care. But I said, even if you don't care about your people, how come you're not care about your consumers? They do expect the companies to do the best and to contribute to social and economic problems of the world. You have to do it. I'm sorry, even if you're not feeling it, you have to do it because that's what consumers demand. Part of the activism I see is because millennials and Generation Z will be the 75% of the workforce by 2025, this is what they demand too. What are they gonna do? What are you gonna do with them? You're never gonna be attracting talent. Even with the candidate experience that I see, I go to companies hiring the career pages specifically or to LinkedIn job ads just to try what they're asking for when they want the application. Horrible experiences. You're done. The best talent is already done, but they're not aware of that. Coming back to purpose, it starts with how you hire, how you share the purpose, the values and vision with the whole company. It's not only sharing, it has to come from them. It is a collective intelligence exercise. The executives do not come with the purpose and say, from now on, this is what you need to learn and believe in. No, they have to be part of the decision-making of that statement too. And then you go into the other steps, operational strategy, business strategy, all of them will be driven by that from that point on. If they don't have this foundation set, and not only at the top, but also with everybody in the company, understands, believes, and knows what it is standing for, you make every decision on that. There's no way around it. Sometimes the toughest decisions are going to be made because what you said is your purpose and your values. Values is how we get there. The vision is, of course, what kind of a world do we want to live in because your organization exists? Even if you never get there, but you go in the right direction, do not harm the planet, do not harm the people anymore because we have harmed it so much anyways. And pay attention that everybody expects this from you. That's what the organizations need to do too. I don't know how else they're gonna exist. I really don't know how they are still not paying attention. I don't understand that. There's a level of fear that's blinded to foresight completely and that needs to yeah. change. Absolutely. When you mentioned your friend in the, in the cleaning example, thinking of Method, which is a company based in yes, the United States. Yes, I know. I put it there on purpose, it decision-making for dummies. One of the things I've been wanting to do is a strategic conversation about regenerating the level of vitality on the planet, because each country has its own gaps. Gap frame out of Switzerland, I've profiled it on this podcast. Those conversations would shift to a much higher level of purpose. If they were looking at a larger context, then what's in it for me? That's a very yes. base yes. level of awareness. One thing we didn't talk about, but I think it's really important, is that we have a responsibility as individuals to look inside and understand what matters to us. How do I use my skills, my passion, and my skill set gifts to this world to contribute something? It could be planet, it could be plants, it could be animals, it could be the great architectural systems that we created to protect them. It might not be even a real living thing, but another kind of living thing. The organizations need to do the same. What is our values, our visions, our purpose? And then once they are very clear and they're authentic about it, then they want to hire the people who know what they want in life too. The beautiful point is when your individual purpose matches and aligns with the company's purpose. That's when the alignment happens. And it never aligned with me. That's why I wanted to do my own business because I wanted to be able to express my purpose in some way. If more companies do a good job with that, they will be able to find the best talent. Some companies are doing workshops in the company to make sure that their people know and understand and discover their purpose, their individual purpose. That's also important too. They're the most advanced ones. And if the purpose doesn't align, they're okay if people leave. That's okay. It's yeah. not like, oh my God, what am I going to do? Because they know they come from abundance mindset. They know the people that is going to be attracted to them will find them in some way. They want people to have a meaningful life, whatever that is. And it's not in a controlling way, obviously. Yeah. yeah. 
Beautifully said, Brooke. Thank you very much. You've mentioned your YouTube channel a couple of times. Where should uh -huh. people go to watch it and listen to some of the stories you've been gathering? My channel name is Purposeful Life Channel. And I have a couple of playlists. One is for individual purpose. One is for organizational purpose. And the last one I'm working on is the Purposeful Leader Series. Those are the interviews that I do with some of the companies that I mentioned. They're very inspiring. Like Bob Chapman is one that I didn't mention today, but it's very Way Miller's like CEO. Unbelievable guy. Again, very caring leader. I want to put it out there so that people do get inspired, especially new founders, maybe some organizations that are already thinking to transform their culture. Hopefully that inspires some leaders out there to do the right thing. Pred Rebels said it beautifully in one of their blog posts, just one sentence. I think the title was, why would you want to bring purpose to companies? I told them, I'm going to read it when I have time. They said, no, go right now and read it because there was only one sentence, because it is the right thing to do. Hmm. That's yeah. it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, I, even people like me are refraining from saying, you know what, this engages your people more. Engagement, productivity, increase your profit. I had a, a great conversation with somebody in UK who is in this work too. Now companies want to do it just to increase their profit. We don't want that. Yes, it increases your revenue profit, but do it for the right reasons because it's not going to stick otherwise. It's a mindset shift that should be enduring. It's yeah. not a purpose statement that makes you purpose driven or giving a big fact check to an NGO doesn't make you a purposeful driven company. It's the core of your business. That's yeah. something that I still see people still don't get. It, unfortunately, they just don't understand the meaning and the depth of the work. I love that you put that forward because depth is what we're called to be now. What you're talking about, yes. my way of framing it is an ethos. It's an, an ethos that permeates each and every individual plus the company. It's a much higher level of responsibility, much higher level of integrity, and a real sense that we're part of something bigger just by definition. I think you summarized it so well, and that's the consciousness level that we should all get to. I know you are doing a lot of amazing work around that, and thank you for all you do. I'm glad. I've been being in this world for quite some time now. I definitely see that at least having these conversations now on a daily basis is amazing. From the time where I was talking purpose and I was the weirdest one to this day, where now it's such a big conversation now that we're diluting it, <laughs> but at least we're having conversations is still a good improvement. It still gives me hope. I'm with you. So thank you very much for being on the program. And thank you for all that you do to support the work that I've been doing with respect to this podcast and our co-authorship on the book and other things that I'm sure are coming up ahead. But your support on the podcast promotion is an absolute blessing because it's the one area that I'm not very good at. Yes. If you're listening to this podcast, it's probably due to Brooks, uh, beautiful social skills. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You deserve that. What I'm doing with my YouTube videos is the same for you too. It's just to inspire others because you have beautiful conversations with so amazing people. People should know. And then of course, everybody can choose what to listen, what to read, but at least they know that it exists really. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's my pleasure to share that, of course. Yeah. Thank you for being on the program. I'll put your other links in the show notes. Thank you, yeah. Donna. Thanks for having me. Thanks oh. for all you do. The pandemic certainly revealed the true colors in terms of companies' sense of purpose, their loyalty to employees, even their creative thinking around how can we handle this collectively instead of just handling it with the entire focus being on preserving profit and or profiteering from the pandemic environment. Well, it's been an extremely interesting time to observe what actions were being taken because that's where the talk quickly switches out of the conceptual and into what do people really truly believe in and what are their actual motivations. I really appreciate Brooke's uh, list and all of the notes she has taken on companies that are driven very much by purpose and are not inclined to waver when the going gets tough, because if there's one place you can really test and, and see where people are at, it's when things uh, get really uncertain, unfamiliar, and challenge 
habits. Normally, that's a place where you would shift. You would do something different and not in the worst possible way, but in the best possible way. So this is where these adverse conditions bring out the best in people, but it does take some creative thinking. It takes visionary leadership. It takes a real commitment to that leadership as well. My name is Donna Jones. My work involves adaptive decision-making, helping companies and individuals shift their leadership approach to take into account a completely different context, reconnect back to a much higher level of responsibility for the ecological, social, and economic health as more of an integrative relationship. I certainly hope you'll have the opportunity in listening to this conversation to reflect on what focuses your energies, what focuses your ambitions, your aspirations in terms of purpose. Is it a small item, get through the day, or is it a much larger, like mitigate the effects of climate change or increase the levels of biodiversity worldwide? The scale and scope of purpose has a lot of opportunity embedded in it. I hope going forward that this conversation at least gives you some chance to think about where do you stand with that? How far can you go in terms of thinking expansively? If you like this conversation, please share it. Thank you for joining me today. Connect up on LinkedIn or on Twitter or on Instagram.